Well, it's season seven of G's Culture Podcast. Great to have you with us, wherever you may be. Carrie, I imagine people, you this is the first time you've been on our podcast, but I yeah. imagine people are all over the world <laughs> they are. listening. This is a podcast really just by pastors for pastors, or really church leaders, anybody in the trenches of building a local church. It's great to have you with us. Yeah. Uh, season seven means this. There are six previous seasons that if yeah. you haven't listened to, you got to go back and binge them all. Yeah, they are very binge worthy. They're very binge so worthy. Good. Carrie, I'm going to ask you a question about binging in just a second. That my <laughs> wife and I have a big argument over. Oh no! <laughs> uh, but uh, welcome to the podcast. If you um, are a regular listener, just jumping in, I do want to let you know that our heart really is just to resource pastors and church leaders, anybody building church for revival. And so there's two other areas that we're doing that in as well. The Jesus Culture School of Leadership. It is a four month online intensive. It's about five and a half hours a week. And uh, it's one of the most fruitful things we do. If you want to, honestly, we have a lot of pastors on it, worship leaders, we have different tracks for ministry. If you want to look into that, you can. As well, we do an annual pastor's conference. This is for pastors, church leaders, and their teams. We do one here in the Sacramento area in January, and we now do one in the UK uh, in the summer. So we'd love to have you jump on and be part of that. Carrie, it is great to have you today co-hosting your first ever co-host for the podcast. It's so so exciting to be here. I have listened to every single pastor's podcast. I love them. I think I've texted you after multiple ones. You have. I am just obsessed with this podcast, so I'm so happy to be here. Well, thank you for flying down and being part of it. Yeah. Can you really quickly just tell us who you are and your husband and you pastor a phenomenal church up yeah. in the PNW? Yeah, in the, in the great PNW. We love it. Um, it has its challenges, but yeah, my husband Isaac and I, we started our church um, in our house 13 years ago, have been an established church for about 12 years, and we are part Where? of an, a Camas Washougal community, which is right outside of Portland, Oregon. Okay. So we get a lot of Portland people. Um, are you in Oregon? No, we are in... So just for people that yeah. don't know the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> yes. you're right outside Portland, yeah. but you're in Washington. So the so Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington are kind of like twin cities. Vancouver, Washington has gotten a lot bigger the past several years. Just go right across the bridge into a new right state. Just right across yeah. the bridge. It's it's awesome. So in Portland, you don't have any tax. So you can go over there and do all your shopping yes, and yes. then come right back over the bridge and live where it's good. Um, but yes, so we have our church over there and um, yeah, we're doing great. We love it. Love pastors. Um, we've known you for about three years, and just your leadership has really just affected Isaac and I and changed our life, honestly. And uh, so, thank well, you so much for everything that you do. We absolutely it adore. Is, One of my favorite memories would yeah. be the uh, uh, Disneyland <laughs> yes. and the whole thing. Tell us real quick, um, yeah. you guys, Pastor Phenomenal Church up there, uh, what is the thing that surprised you most about both church planning and senior pastoring? Oh, my goodness. What is the most, um, I mean, I think the most surprising thing. So we came straight from youth ministry. So um, we did youth ministry for eight years. And I think, you know, it's easy to tell kids what to do, you know, and then all of a sudden you're moving into this senior pastor role. And um, we were both in our 30s. So we were a little younger. Um, Early, mid, late 30s. Yeah, mid 30s. Okay. So I was 31. And Isaac was 35 when we started the church. Let me just clarify something real quick for you, Carrie. 31 is not mid-30s. Okay. Well, <laughs> Isaac's just, mid-30s. Okay. And that's the I truth just, is I always forget how old I am. I just I'm... want to say, right, when you say <laughs> mid-30s and then you said 31, right. I'm like, I don't, right. I don't know if you yeah. know how early, mid, and late <laughs> 31. decades 31. I'm work. in my mid-30s. I'm 31. You were in your early um, 30s. Yes. You married a guy significantly older than you. <laughs> so much older. And that is one thing he does not like to talk about. <laughs> Well, I, I, he's absolutely going to be listening to this right yeah. now, I'm sure, because yeah. he's your biggest fan. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so Sorry, uh, what's it been like married to an older man? Yeah, uh, I mean, he's we, so <laughs> old. <laughs> Do you even have the same interests? I mean, uh, it's very true. I will say, I can never he, tell him. I know. And I'm... So he's 47 right now, and if I ever tell him that you're almost 50, I mean, <laughs> he gets silent for hours. He's this like, I'm is, not going to talk to you anymore. He see, does not like to talk do about you know that. that I just, I, I'm 48, and yeah. I full on, I just feel like 50 staring at me. Yeah. Like it's a weird, like a 50's just looking at me yeah. right now, and going, I just want to oh, prepare you're... you for that. Like that's a big deal, but he doesn't like to talk if about it. If you know anything about your husband, he loves denial. Yeah. He just denial. <laughs> He's like, I'm not gonna. I'm denial not gonna think about is it. how you get through yeah. life. So, most surprising thing about you're you're in your early and mid 30s as a couple. <laughs> most surprising yeah. thing about 
church plan and senior pastoring? Yeah, no surprising thing. Yeah, I mean, well, the most wonderful thing is just doing life with people. And you're um, like, we started the church with a lot of young families. And, you know, you're doing set up and tear down and doing all the things. And you're like, can you get there on Sunday morning at 530 in the morning with your four children? And um, but what I think surprised us most is just how close you really get to that core team of people that you're planning yeah. the church with. Yeah. And um, I think that's what drew people in was that we really became a close family. And most of our team is still the same from that 13 years ago. The people who were doing set up and tear down with us at 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning yeah, are totally. still our people because you do. There's so much growth that takes place in you when you're like doing that together, serving, serving together. So. Um, yeah, that's a that's honestly it's such a gift to be able to work alongside of those same people for so many years. Number one area you had to grow in that you didn't even realize you're going to have to grow in, but the number one area that you uh-huh. that required growth as you stepped out of youth ministry into senior pastoring. Yeah, I mean, I think the confidence in discipleship like really being confident that I knew my word and I knew prophetically what God's doing and just trying to really step out in that confidence and lead. I mean, that took probably 10 years. I mean, I think in the past three years is when I really feel like that confidence, but that's definitely, I mean, maybe Isaac didn't deal with that as much, but I definitely, yeah, that's something I had to grow in was really discipling people who are your peers you yeah, know, yeah. That's, that can be really tough. No, to it do. really is. You're trying to spiritually <laughs> lead. Yeah. When you're in youth ministry, you're obviously older than yeah, them. And you're easy to spiritually tell them what to do. leading them. I've yeah. been there. I know you're going through. It's very easy to direct yes. you. But it's right. And it's not just people our age. There are people older than us now. Oh, exactly. That we're leading because yeah. you're leading that community. It's one of the things I say about see, about pastoral preaching. Yeah. Different than you, when you're a senior pastor versus when you're talking to teenagers, you're talking to a very select group of people. Yeah. They're all going through the exact same thing. You know yeah. exactly what they're going through. Yeah. You get into a room of people now who they're so all over much. the map. Some all people, map. some people have been serving God for forty years of their mm-hmm. life. They've read the Bible through every year. Mm-hmm. Some people <laughs> aren't saved. Some people are in their yeah. mid thirties yeah. and <laughs> are just trying to get to church every yeah. day, have a marital yeah. problem. Some are in, they just, you know, sleeping yeah. around the night before and they yeah. show up. they're all over the board. And hurt by church yes. and you don't know what they're coming and you're, from. And you're having yeah. to preach to that whole group of people yeah. and lead that community. And staring at you like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's a lot. I love yeah. it. Okay. Listen, um, my, this has nothing to do with the pastor podcast, but you mentioned there's six seasons before you need yeah. to go binge them. They're really yeah. good. Some of the best interviews and guests and and Amazing. conversations. I, I, I do the podcast just for me, just so I can sit and talk to people. <laughs> but um, you and my wife are kind of Marco Polo BFFs. Yes, we are. Yep. And, She's the uh, only person I Marco Polo. That's hilarious. <laughs> and so uh, CJ and I have a difference of how we watch television shows. Yeah. And so she very much is like, you start a show and you just wa- you just watch the entire thing through. I'm the same way. You start one episode, next yeah. episode, next episode, yeah. next episode, all seven seasons. Where I'm like, Do you, like you to watch save it? you watch one, maybe two, and then you watch another television show for a little bit. You like because Aww. I come from the thing of you watched one episode a week and waited for the next episode the next. Week. Well, yeah. I mean, that's what we all came from. Yes, but now that you can binge no. it, then you don't get the full feeling of the show. Uh, like, I want right, to well, be fully you know, in. I can see why you're a BFF yeah. with my <laughs> wife on Marco Polo because you're both you're both delusional. <laughs> it, it becomes monotone is the problem. No, it's this. It's just so a monotone storyline. Oh no! The, and like you're so invested. Like if you keep taking breaks, but so you do like to. We used to all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it's my short attention span, but yeah. Do you feel like you just kind of lose it? But I like, I I'm love just... it. Like we are binging. This is crazy. We are binging Deadliest Catch right now. Have you ever watched that? It's the best like binge, and there's 20 seasons. You can watch it for the rest. Can of your we life. have this conversation real quick talking about <laughs> Deadliest Catch? You have a an alter ego that, yes, I that do. you have it's a true. you have a full on alter this ego. This is embarrassing. On Instagram, <laughs> thousands <laughs> of followers on Instagram because of this is embarrassing. fishing. Yes, yes. You actually are like a an accomplished, <laughs> legit people follow you on Instagram, fisher woman. They do follow me. I know. Okay, so I grew up in Alaska, and my dad would just take us fishing every single weekend. And it was a way to stay close to my dad. And then it became a passion of mine, too. So now my dad and I go back to Alaska and fish every year. And then Isaac and I got to go this year. So now we go, like, multiple times a year and go fishing. And you fishing. just film it. 
and you just film it. And then I you mean, just show fish. I I follow I, get, I follow yeah. your alter e- alter ego on yeah. Instagram. And I'm like, hey, yeah. there's a f- why not really cool looking fish. <laughs> and people send me free stuff. So I've it's never like, even I don't even know the fish you're showing me, and I'm like, <laughs> it's fascinating. Is it fascinating? Yes, it's oh, fascinating. That makes me feel good. Tell people tell people what the Instagram is. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> tell people. Come on, come on, tell people. Okay, so it's A K Kenai Girl, and the <laughs> how do you spell that? <laughs> well, it's it's A K for Alaska. Alaska, and then Kenai. How do you spell that? K E N A I, okay. which is the Kenai River okay. in Alaska. So A K Kenai Girl, which is totally. I actually totally... never knew that. I followed you, but never knew that. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know that. I would just, okay. I don't know what you, I don't know. What I know. I'm, I'm totally a poser though. I mean, it's, it just is what it is. I don't live on the Kenai River. People think I'm a guide up there. Yeah. I'm, you know. Yeah, whatever. It's working. But I, I love it. I get free stuff. It's, so it's, it's all for the free it's things. It's random and amazing. <laughs> That's the thing. Hey, we're excited to have Tim yeah. Timberlake as our guest today. I'm so excited. Tim is a phenomenal preacher, pastor, author, leader, the whole thing. You're going to love the conversation today. But you actually did a little bit of a deep dive on him recently. Yes, I have. Because you said, hey, we're going to be doing the interview. And, and, yeah. and you've been actually, a lot of his stuff is really been ministering to you. It really has. I mean, even just what he has walked through his journey in life, he lost his dad when he was younger and his dad was an incredible pastor and then yeah. he ended up taking over his dad's church yeah. and what he has become is amazing. Uh, I can't wait. We're going to have, it's one of my favorite things just to yeah. sit down with pastors who are yeah. in the trenches of all, all over and all different. Yeah. And I, I'm excited to jump in. I'm glad you're here today. It's going to be a good interview. It's going to be good. Well, it is so good to have first time on the Pastors Podcast, and I think I can say that this is every pastor's kind of dream list. I think yeah. I could confidently say that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that This is really what every pastor <laughs> dreams about. It's great to have Tim Timberlake on the podcast with us. Mm-hmm. Tim, I, I really mean this. We really appreciate you taking time to just jump in and connect. Man, I'm so honored to be on here with you all, and, and just to have an opportunity to converse, spend some time talking uh, not just to pastors and leaders, but to people that aspire and desire to be in uh, ministry in any role. I think what you all are doing uh, in leading and spearheading this podcast is needed. I think that uh, it is uh, incredible, and I'm inspired by it, and so I'm honored to be on here with you all today. Thank you. I, it really is. Yeah, we love having you. With so many mutual friends that just speak so highly of you, and obviously all that you've done as a pastor and preacher and author and all the rest of it. Tim, can you really quickly, most people would have a grid for who you are and kind of what you're doing, but can you can you give your story a little bit of both what you're doing right now, but how you got into pastoring? Yeah, I, I don't know if many people would would know of who I am. You know, I never assume and so I, I'm always encouraged when I get an opportunity to speak to uh, new audiences and, and new opportunities to just kind of uh, give some backstory as to who I am. And I'm a country kid, man, born and raised in a town called Creedmoor, North Carolina, uh, which has a grand uh, total of 1,400 people in population. <laughs> I love it. A, a, a metropolitan city. That's when you know yeah. you're going to be homecoming king. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you know something sure. special is going to become of your life. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was, it was, this is the God on the street. It was a big deal for us when we yeah. got our first stoplight. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was going to say that. It was like, it was like revival. Like a ribbon ceremony. We got Walgreens. Yeah. It was. How many of the old people were irritated by the stoplight? I mean, it, the people that drove cars <laughs> yeah. were yeah. were excited. The people yeah. that were still on horse and buggy were <laughs> absolutely irritated. So you know, that's that's the type of town I grew up. in. That's amazing. Oh it, it was that like that type of town. And so the crazy thing about Creedmoor is the church that my parents planted. Uh, in the late 60s, it ended up growing larger than the population of the city that it was in. And so the city loved us uh, on every day except for Sunday because traffic <laughs> would be so backed up you needed in that our stoplight. little city that it would take literally all the city's resources to control traffic for service on Sunday. And so imagine this in a city of 1,400 people uh, a church of eleven thousand. It was it was literally uh, the largest church in the area, and um, God had graced my parents um, to speak specifically into what biblical marriage is, 
um, how to steward your family well, uh, how to steward finances. And this was teachings that in the late 60s and 70s was uncommon and unfamiliar, particularly in the South. And my parents went on global television and, you know, they were the second African-Americans to go on global television behind uh, Dr. Fred Price. Every wow. Day, every mm. day, every yes. Day. And my mom was the first uh, female pastor to preach alongside of her husband. And so you have this, this dynamic of what people are watching. And so people would drive from all over uh, kind of the East Coast on a weekly basis just to kind of be in this service. And uh, something that was different, it wasn't a religious service. It was a spirit-led service. Um, and so their spiritual foundation was uh, Dr. Oral Roberts. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they believed in healing. They wow. believed in Come the power on. of the spirit. And so uh, it was really... Uh, a, a movement of different things for that particular time. And it just intrigued people. People had never been in a service uh, where the power of the Holy Spirit began to move. And you had people that were uh, walking away from their denominations uh, and their circles and coming to this church and uh, the unsaved getting radically saved and uh, being on fire for Jesus Christ. And it, it caused a lot of problems in our little city. I can imagine. And, I can't even uh, imagine. It caused yeah. a, lot of, a lot of problems in our area. Uh, people called uh, our church a cult and, you know, all the different crazy things that you uh, can expect and anticipate to be called whenever God begins to do something different. And so that's kind of the uh, environment I grew up around. And because of that, and because of how I saw my parents get treated and just the um, dynamic of them doing something for God, but it seemed like so much opposition coming up against them. I had no desire to be in ministry and uh, I knew about God and I I was glad that my parents were helping other people connect to him, but I wanted nothing to do with ministry. I wanted nothing to do uh, with pastoring and uh, it got even worse when at 12 years old, my dad got terminally ill with throat cancer and doctors gave him three weeks to live. And um, they gave him the option of having this kind of experimental surgery where they cut him from the back of one ear, opened up his throat entirely, and the incision would stop on the back of his right ear. And uh, they told him that there was a slim chance that he would survive. And if he survived it, uh, he would have difficulties for the rest of his life, but those odds would be better than him dying in two to three weeks. And so he opted for the surgery and it was a difficult surgery. Uh, They were able to remove uh, the tumor from his throat, which was the size of a chipmunk. Uh, But in doing so, they removed the quarter of his tongue. So he was no longer able to eat, drink, or swallow. And he was fed through a G-tube for the remainder of his life, which was five years. And so my dad was a big guy in stature, uh, 6'5", 265 pounds. And he led the state in North Carolina, number one basketball recruit, all four years of high school. And and he was just a a dominant figure. And I saw my hero uh, kind of become a shell of himself. And uh, with the strength that he had left, uh, I would see him every single weekend leave the hospital, go preach at church, leave church, go back to the hospital. And his desire was still to infuse hope and life into people and to show people what faithfulness looked like, what consistency looked like, what endurance looked like, what long suffering looked like. And he loved us and he loved my mom uh, through this in, in, in just crazy process. And at 12 years old, when you see that happen to your hero, you really don't have a relationship with Jesus for yourself. Your perspective is shaken and mine was shaken. And my thought process was if this is the way God treats his son, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I won't parts of a God like that. And I knew about God and I I had faith, but my faith stood on the shoulders of my parents. And it wasn't until I developed my relationship with God and I had this crazy encounter with God some years later um, that I I realized that it was not the will of God and that was not God's doing. And so, you know, for the next five years, I saw my dad fight for his life and and, uh, fight for 
the purpose that God had placed on he and my mom and just steward it with so much integrity and steward it with every ounce of his being and continue to encourage people and continue, which was which was crazy to me, continue to be used by God in a supernatural way to see wow. thousands healed wow. of the very thing that he was battling with. And so I had this faith tension and frustration and just kind of battled with God for years and years and, and finally came to the point where I was angry with God. And I ended up going to college to play a little basketball at a small division one school. And I remember being in my apartment and um, falling asleep and thinking that I had uh, woken up. And when I did, I was standing on this stage in front of a sea full of people, more people than I could see the end of. And I looked down at my hands and it was blood smudged on my hands. And I tried to wipe the blood off of my pants. And no matter how hard I wiped, I could still see just a smudge of blood. And so when I realized what was happening, I heard the voice of God so clear for the first time say, the longer you run from what <laughs> I've called you to do and who you could have influenced, their blood will be held to your account. And wow. I woke up mm-hmm. immediately and I was scared out of my mind. And like every child that's afraid of something, I call my mom and I'm like, mom, this is, this is a dream that I had. I'm thinking, man, she's going to have uh, just so much encouragement. She's going to be like, oh my gosh, that is crazy. <laughs> and I am here for you, baby. And oh, come home and oh, tell me more. I told her the dream and she kind of stopped for a second. And then she, she burst out laughing, like hysterically. And so it confused me. I was like, what the heck are you laughing at? <laughs> and she said, that's the same dream your dad had when God called him in the ministry. Ooh, <laughs> you're kidding. Oh, uh, that's, that's the goosebumps. <laughs> Come on. I'm telling you, I left, I left where I was that week, transferred to Bible college, and finished up. Moved back to North Carolina, became the co-pastor along with my mom at 20 years old and served there faithfully for 16 years until uh, God called us to Jacksonville to steward what we're now stewarding. Wow. Tim, first of all, it's such such an incredible story. Do you feel a responsibility to carry what your father carried? I don't know how to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm fascinated by, like, how do you steward that, which is so profound, the legacy that your dad, both in his his fight and faith, Mm -hmm. as well as just what he built, and then also kind of carrying what what, what God's put on you. How have you navigated that? Yeah, I think the best way for me to honor what my parents have um, stewarded and the vision that God has given them is to pioneer uh, in that same vein. And so I have the saying, and the saying is this, honor the past by pioneering the future. Wow. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I think the greatest way that I could honor their legacy and the greatest way that I could steward what God has done in them that's still thriving. I mean, we we still are standing um, in the very place and in the very prayers that they have prayed uh, my mom just turned 75 um, a few weeks ago, and and she's still serving in ministry, still traveling and speaking, still strong, still, you know, just an incredible giant in the faith. And I was talking to her one day, and um, when I was praying through this decision to come to Jacksonville, and she said, you have to do what we did. And, and I was like, what do you mean by that? She said, you have to pioneer wow. what's different. And that's the greatest thing that you could ever do to honor us. And, and so uh, what she meant by that was they stepped away from their denomination to pi- pioneer something different. And people called them crazy and people called them uh, heretics and people called them just all types of things. And I, I stored it the church that her and my father pastored for 16 years faithfully and God called us to Jacksonville. And it was confusing to me because I had no desire to come. I had no, it was not on my radar at all. And I wrestled with it for a while. And, and, you know, number one, I didn't want to leave the people that I pastored and loved because they had been through so much transition, so much trauma, uh, so many things that were triggering. And number two, uh, I, I found myself um, 
being challenged where I was. And so that was not a challenge I was searching for. Um, and so when you are in a, a town that is now 2,400 people, whoo, somebody say increase, God, <laughs> increase. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when whenever you're in a town that's limited in its capacity uh, to maintain, steward, and grow a church is a challenge. And I love the challenge of that. I loved uh, seeing God do something special and supernatural in what people would call a desolate place or uh, a place where a church in this day and age could not thrive. And so I, I just had no desire to leave. And, and God called me and my wife uh, to Jacksonville, and that confused me. And so I, I think for our listeners to understand, especially PKs that are called in the ministry, yes, mm-hmm. yes, one of the greatest things that you can do to honor the vision of your parents and honor that. the vision mm-hmm. of your leaders I love that. is to walk out in excellence the vision that God has placed in your heart because that adds value to their vision. It adds value to the things that God has placed in their heart. It's the best way to steward and, and it. So that's what I, I aspire to do. I love that. I have an 18 year old son who is called to the ministry and loves it. And I just want to hear from you how you handled being called to the ministry, but also going back to your dad's church, taking that over. It sounds like you did that with your mom. But what that looked like for you, even just living up to people's expectations. I mean, I know you did at that time, even now. You obviously have experienced fame and success and just living up to people's expectations and being bold, but humble as well, how you navigate through that. So, yeah, my, my parents were really wild and they were, they, they would be considered today um, as kind of different. And what I mean by that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, they were the couple that were like matching outfits. <laughs> and, I love it. Uh, yeah. You know, they were really bright colors. And, um, but they, they weren't like crazy, which is, is, is an odd combination. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't seek out attention. And so the thing that I love about my parents and every time I'm around my mom and every time I see a video of my dad, the thing that it does is it makes me want to be more like me. And I know that sounds crazy because so often you get around inspiring people. Such and people a good often word. Say, yeah, I want to be I want to be more like them but but being around the right leaders and being around the right voices specifically as a, a young leader in such a formative age like 18 get around people that make you want to be more like you because God has given you a specific intentional specific grace and anointing and gifting And you have to mine that out. And sometimes that gets buried when we are around leaders that desire for us to be more like them. And so whenever I see the leadership of Jesus and whenever I see the model of Jesus' leadership, although there's a a, a instruction and a desire for the disciples to become like Jesus, Jesus allows them to be themselves. And so Peter still has, you know, these issues and 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 he, he knew Judas was going to betray him and he he still allowed him to fulfill his purpose. And that's why he calls Judas friend and he calls Peter the enemy. He tells Peter, get thee behind thee, Satan. And and so often people read that and they're like, okay, why would he call Judas friend? And why would he call Peter, Peter Satan? Satan? It's yeah. because Peter was trying to delay him from fulfilling his God-given destiny. And Judas was trying to help him fulfill his God-given Oof. destiny. <laughs> and so that's a word. whenever we find our ourselves in this position where we can glean and learn from the people around us, I I think that we have to be around leaders who are secure enough in their leadership where they want us to become more like the God-given gifts that he's placed on the inside of us. And so that's what I would encourage your son with at 18 years old. Thank you so much. How do you, you know, one of the things that we encounter with in leaders and pastors, it's just, it's interesting, even even at the top levels, Mm -hmm. massive levels of insecurity. Yeah. Or just as bold as they may be sometimes, behind closed doors, just uh, just 
a lack of confidence. Yeah. What you described, which is so brilliant, yeah. that just be who you are. And I love that thing. Like you're, I've, I've thought this. I'm like, you look at your parents and go, that's who they are. Yeah. That's authentic. Yeah. That's all, yeah. The, the inauthenticity is what yeah. drives me crazy. But what would you talk to leaders about, about really saying, listen, because I think a lot of leaders don't want to be who they are because they don't think it's enough. Yeah. At some level, they're trying to be somebody else or they mm -hmm. want to be something else because they just don't think that who they are is actually enough. Mm -hmm. How do you speak into leaders in that? Yeah, I, I think that we live in a society and um, day and age where leaders are so focused on being popular. Yes. It's so true. That's that such a good we word. sacrifice our ability to be powerful. And whenever we seek out popularity, we lose our power. And so we have a group of leaders that are so insecure because their leadership rises and falls off of the scales of compliments. Wow. And when you live for compliments, <laughs> you'll die emotionally when you don't get them. And so you see this roller coaster of emotion and you see this roller coaster of excellence and leadership because people, they seek that out. And, and I believe that, you know, unfortunately people have made an occupation of pastoring instead of a calling out of it. And so you step into something because it makes you feel a certain way and you get affirmation from certain people that you've never gotten before. Yes. Yeah. And that's yes. leading. Yeah, and it it's temporal. And so when that season fades and when you're no longer the popular person, uh, you lose your identity because you found your identity in that. How do you solve that? You're about to, you're about to say this, but how do you solve that for them? Yeah, I, I would say to the pastors that struggle with that, you have to kill it every single day. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Kill it because every single day. Because what you don't heal mm -hmm. in your leadership that is contrary to the call and the assignment that God has placed in your life, it's actually strangling that assignment and that gifting. And what we leave unchecked eventually grows. And, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot of leaders that are being led by the wrong things, being inspired by the wrong things. And that's not to say that they're, all sin and bad things, but they are bad in reference to what God has called you to do. And so I would just say, kill it every single day and make sure that it's surrendered and submitted to the feet of Jesus. So at the end of your life, uh, you get the two words that matter most, and that's well done. And, and that's what <laughs> uh, affirmation and approval I'm searching for. And the older you get, the more you realize it doesn't matter what people think about yeah, you. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's one of the most freeing and liberating things. As I get older, I could care less who thinks I'm popular, who is like enamored by me, who's fascinated by me. I, I just don't care. And I, I look at the life of my parents as they got older. I look at my grandparents who my God went through hardships and, and trials and tribulations that I have never faced. And uh, they were one step, my grandfather and my grandmother, uh, one step removed from being slaves. They were something called sharecroppers. And sharecroppers did not own their own property. They stayed on the property of the person who owned the land and they worked the land to stay on the property for free. And while they did that, they pastored. Wow. Jeez. And they pastored faithfully. And what encourages me to be faithful, to be consistent, to have long suffering, to endure well, to not complain and murmur, they did for free with joy. I mean, my goodness. What many have an opportunity to have their lives sold into and platformed and celebrated and championed. Like I, I would talk to my grandfather before he died. And it's just so humbling to think about it. He would ask me, grandson, what is it like to get on an airplane? You, you, get on, you get on this thing and it takes you in the air and it places you back on the ground. And then you, you go talk to an audience that's in a different state or a different country. He could not, he could not fascinate it. Before he died, we were able to take him to the beach for the very first time. 
like put his feet in sand. He never, he never could imagine. And so for the leaders that are listening to this, man, may we be so hungry uh, to see Jesus do something in and through us that we steward this responsibility with humility and with honor and with reverence and not make it about us, but make it all about Jesus. Have yeah. you, is that the key? For, man, it's so profound what you're sharing about the connection with your parents and grandparents and how it's grounded you. Because as I listen to your story, like there's real hardships or curveballs, whether you're 12 with your dad or even as you stepped into this pastorate at 36, and I'm sure you were going in uh, mm-hmm. thinking it was going to be in the midst of beauty. There's been real difficulty the last four years of what you've walked through. Is that how you have guarded your heart and not fallen into entitled complaining mode? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, it, it, because it's in ministry, there are real curveballs that come at yeah. us, unexpected, mm-hmm. that are hard that we walk through. And I just find that thing, even in myself, I find that thing where I'm just frustrated. Mm-hmm. I begin to feel like... Yeah. Like this, like I feel entitled maybe not to walk through difficult yeah. things. Yeah. They shouldn't take as long as they are. They're dragged on. I remember getting on a plane one time, irritated that I had a middle seat. Yeah. Well, that is irritating. Yeah, that is irritating. <laughs> but yeah, and I remember having to yeah. stop and go, why? Yeah. What is going I'm pr- I'm flying to a New York City to go mm-hmm. stay in some really nice hotel and get fed and go. How, is that how, what you're describing right there, has that been the key to not fall into entitlement and complaining and guard your heart in the midst of walking through things that are not only hard, but were unexpected? Yeah, I, I think, and this is this may not be for everybody, but I've never had a season in my leadership walk where there wasn't some level of great pain and difficulty. And so I would say humility for me is the fruit of pain. And I, I'm often reminded 20, 19 years ago, my first year pastoring. And I'm 20 years old and I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm pastoring this church at the time that's large. And we got a large building. We got a lot of land. We have... Um, a school that's K through 12. We have our senior citizens facility where uh, we allow seniors 65 and up to stay in apartments that we've built for whatever they can afford. And I'm stewarding this and I'm like, okay, God, what the heck do I do? And I remember God asking me this question. If I took another 20 year old with the same gift setting, with the same grace, with the same talent, with the same anointing as you had, would they do this assignment better than you? And that was a humbling question. And I had to really think about that. I had to really do some searching and do some do some spiritual, personal inventory. And the answer was yes. If there was someone else that God gave the same responsibility to, they would steward that thing better than me. And at that moment, I had a godly conviction to lead my life rather than follow my life. And that's the thing with a bunch of leaders. They're following their life. They're allowing life to happen to them instead of them leading their life. And anytime we get in the season where we allow life to happen to us, we begin to follow our life instead of lead it. And that's a very dangerous thing for us as leaders. And so we have to lead our life and we have to make sure that with what God has entrusted to us, no one else with the same gift setting, the same grace, the same anointing would do a better job at stewarding it than us. And uh, that was 19 years ago. And I think today um, I'm doing the best that I can with the gifts, the resources, the anointings and the graces that God has given me. And I just refuse to allow somebody else with the same things to do it better than me. You know, something, I read your book, 1440, which um, was incredible. I love the the whole idea of just living for every moment. And it sounds like maybe, did you write that when you were planting your church? No. So I, that book came from, you know, oftentimes when people write books, they either write it from a great place or they write it from a place of, pain and regret. That that book came from a, a place of pain and regret. And it, it kind of was birthed um, 
in COVID. And I was thinking about just time and how we steward time. Yeah. And the time that I wish I could go back. And it, it really came from a conversation that me and my father had uh, my 18th birthday. And my dad sat down with me for about five hours. And I was not following Jesus Christ at the time. And my dad just, he really prophesied over me. And he told me the plan and the purpose that God had for me. And my mind was on what I was going to do for my 18th birthday. And where I was going to go, where I was going to eat, what friends I was going to see, who I was going to hang with. Uh, I was going to go to the mall and then go to the movies <laughs> at night. And, mm-hmm. and and my mind is everywhere else. And my dad, is he's, he's, he's right beside me and he's sharing his heart with me. And after about five hours, he pats me on the leg and he goes upstairs to his room. And 2 a.m. that next morning, my mom knocks on the door. She says, I need you to help me get your dad out of bed. He's not responding. Oh so I go into his room and my father's transition. And I remember thinking to myself, I wish I had more time. I wish I had been more aware of the conversation he was having because he knew I didn't. Yeah. And so from that moment, I, I, I just desired to be hyper aware of every conversation and be where my feet were be present in the moment and wanted to share you know the importance of that with the readers and and the listeners because i I think we we oftentimes get what i call destination addiction and destination addiction is we would rather be somewhere else than where we are right now and so i'll be happier when i get the house i'll be happier when i get the car i'll be happier when my church grows i'll be happier when i get a building and you'll never be happier there until you find happiness right where you are. Mm-hmm. Incredible what you're sharing. Let me take a, a little bit of a hard left only because of time. Mm-hmm. My pastor, Bill Johnson, would say that, that all truth is true, but all truth is not equal. Okay. In regards to um, truth, actually, there are certain truths that are more important in that they're foundational. Mm-hmm. Once you get that truth in place, everything else kind of comes from yeah. that. Some okay. of what you're sharing, that's what it feels like. That I can feel in the room right now, just the weightiness of it, you yeah. know? You feel like there's a weightiness to what you're sharing right mm-hmm. now. Because ultimately, I think everybody that's listening or watching right now, this stuff that, that Tim's talking about is one of those things. These are those foundational mm-hmm. things yeah. that if you can get them established in your life, go do the work mm-hmm. about these yeah. because from there, health comes. Yeah. From there, thriving and joy comes. So that's why I feel the weightiness of it. But let me take a quick okay. left turn. <laughs> left turn. Can you really quickly just practically um, talk to people? I would love to know if you were sitting in a room with 10 preachers in your living room, What's the top thought you're giving them around preaching and but both the delivery, but the communication of the word of God, the preparation into that thing for you? I mean, obviously a very gifted communicator you come from. I, I First of all, I want to know your grandfather, by the way. Mm-hmm. I, the, the, I mean, the heritage you come from, the legacy you come from is just so rich. What is that thing that you've said, hey, both from who I grew up with, my family, my grand, my mom, my dad, my grandparents, but also what I've learned. What is that thing that you would give to preachers that you would talk to them yeah, about? Yeah, the thing, the thing that I would encourage uh, pastors, preachers, teachers, communicators of the gospel with that I've both seen and both learned is stages are given to performers, but platforms are given to people who steward godly influence. And so instead of seeking a stage, seek to grow your roots deeper in the spirit of God and eliminate every distraction that's pulling you out of becoming God's best. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is whenever God desires to elevate you, he requires you to eliminate something else. And so you have to eliminate the distractions and you have to eliminate everything that is not vital and necessary to the assignment that God has called you to walk out and steward. And and here's why. Um, Anything that you become successful in that's not a part of your purpose and your plan takes time away from the very thing that God desires for you 
to walk in. And so one of my greatest fears is not failing. One of my greatest fears is being successful at something God never called me to be successful at uh, because it would take time away from the purpose and the plan that God has for my life. And so I would encourage pastors to not seek stages, work on your craft. You work on your craft by spending time with God and spending time in the presence of God. And I'll explain it in a story. I went to go speak at this conference uh, a few years ago, and uh, the conference was was themed, and the pastor had asked me to speak on this specific verse. And um, the verse was uh, Psalms 23, Lord is my shepherd. And so I'm preparing for this conference and there was another pastor um, speaking in front of me. And so in a lot of um, your African-American churches or denominational churches, there's a preaching practice called hooping. And this particular pra- uh, <laughs> pastor had been bought up in, in that practice. And so they, they don't have that in the pre- Pacific Northwest. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, I'm excited. So, North yeah, Carolina. So give my listeners an this, idea. This is North Carolina. You have a cadence and, and kind of a song to your preaching. It's like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. And so they, it's an art form and it's beautiful. Uh, but sometimes, uh, Pastors and communicators make it more about the art than they do about Jesus. And this pastor um, preached the same text, and he was preaching it before me. And as he's going through this hooping, the people are sitting there, and some are clapping, and um, some are responding. And uh, right after he gets off stage, um, the pastor comes up, and he introduces me. And I just felt led of the Holy Spirit to just talk through that verse, just to speak through it. And as I began to speak through it, people started to cry. And other people began to weep. And I could just hear the sniffles around the room. And after it was over, the pastor that went before me said, how how did you do that? Wow. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, you talked about the scripture. I talked about God. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And there's a difference between knowing scripture and knowing God for yourself. And so for the pastors, the leaders, the communicators that are listening, don't settle for just reading information develop a deep well in your soul that longs for the presence of God, longs for the spirit of God to lead you, to guide you, to fill your your heart with truth, to fill your spirit with his word. And so I, I truly believe that you should study yourself full, pray yourself hot, And when you step on the platform that God gives you, empty yourself of everything that he's placed on the inside of you. Well, there you go. Thank you for (laughs) that. that. That's why I asked the question. Let let, let me say before before we say thank you so much for coming on, uh, two things. One, mind-blowing that a church would (laughs) would give one preacher the same passage and the next preacher the same passage. I can't even like wrap, I can't even wrap my head around going to speak at a conference, one where somebody gives me the passage. Yeah. I just tell them I'm not your guy. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry. But but second, the fact that the guy before me is preaching the same passage. I mean, I'm for real. I can't even wrap my, I don't, yeah. I just, that's a whole different, that's a planet I'm not in. I tell my staff, I, I always, I always take one of those a year. That's, it's, probably, it's probably good, it's good for, good for you. Yeah. It's probably good for you. The the second thing is this, yeah. is when he says for his 18th birthday, you know mm. you're from a small town when you're going to the mall, <laughs> when part of your plan. Or it's just when, aging when us. Part yeah. Of your, no, when, when, yeah, or it's just aging us. I'm going to the mall. <laughs> like, 
like there's yeah. not a young person yeah. in America right now who turning 18 is no, like, what I'm are you doing? I'm going to the mall. I'm, I th- well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the mall first. I'm going to go to the mall first. <laughs> so Pharaoh's <laughs> Pizza and Foot Locker, baby. Foot Locker. <laughs> Tim, how do they, obviously, I could talk, I kid you not, this is not hyper, I could talk for another two hours with you and just pick your brain on stuff and hear kind of so much that I, around leadership and reaching culture and discipleship. But how do people connect more with who you are and what you're doing? Obviously, social media, books, your church you lead, things like that. How do people connect with what you're doing? Yeah, so church is Celebration Church, and you can connect with us at celebration.org. Uh, if you want to follow anything that's going on in my world, you can go to timtimberlake.tv on social media, Instagram, T Timberlake on Twitter, or X now, Tim Timberlake. And uh, yeah, if anyone uh, desires to uh, go on the journey with me, I would be humbled to uh, do life. And I'm not hard to reach. My number is on my Instagram page. If you have a question or desire, uh, you know, prayer or anything, yeah. you can text me. I love it. So it, it's, it's really me, and I really respond. That's incredible. Wow. <laughs> well, Tim, listen, I, I, I don't say this often. We've had a few repeat guests on the podcast, uh, and I would love to have you back sometime. I just <laughs> think— oh, I would be honored. I think, what, I think what you're bringing mm. to pastors and church leaders is— I don't just say this lightly— is is really important right now, so I appreciate that. So we'll do it again. Thanks for, thanks yeah, for coming thank on. Thank you. It's so good. Thank you. Jerry, I think this is part of the problem with doing podcasts. I could literally just, this is not a joke, four hours. I could sit at a table Mm -hmm. with us just talking for four hours about this stuff. And I didn't even like, we, you know, we have questions we want to ask. I don't know if I got to (laughs) just about a third of them. I'm not kidding. I was not prepared for the way I was going to feel during that. I was like holding back tears, just his story and what he's come through. And then to be so grounded in the Lord and the presence of God. And humility. Yeah, I think I just, I don't know what I was expecting, but that was just incredible. I'm so so thankful for that. Well, guys, thanks for joining us wherever you are. I really mean this. We absolutely love uh, uh, anybody who's out there building a local church. We're in the trenches with you. Again, make sure, I say this every time, but Mm -hmm. liking and commenting, it's not really about making me feel better, but it does kind of (laughs) help accelerate and get the word out about the podcast. And then, uh, listen, Jesus Coach School of Leadership, we'd love to see you out at a pastor's conference sometime, either Mm -hmm. here in California or in the UK. So we'll do it again. Mm -hmm.